coming up. You know, having grown up um, in a single parent home with a mother uh, who was and still is mentally ill, you know, I had to fend for myself at an early age. In fact, my mother became mentally ill when I was nine years old. And, you know, I was practically on my own. I had to literally um, raise myself to some extent. Hi, everyone. We are back and welcome to an all new season of the Trailblazers with Tamar McHale. And this week we have quite a phenomenal story. It's the story of Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Gaston Brown. And in this part one of this part two series, he will be sharing how is it that he managed to overcome living in abject poverty to, of course, becoming a prime minister. Stay tuned to find out how. Special thanks to all our current partners and sponsors. If you are interested in sponsoring or partnering with the Trailblazers, send an email to the Trailblazers247 at gmail.com. Some of our most prominent producers mm -hmm. in the industry tell Tony that he could not bust a female artist because wow. your feeling is one thing. Feeling publicly is, is, a, is a very hard thing. My father always said he was growing a prime minister. Had I said I was all in my mouth, the lies were going, and I, put, I sat and I saw women on the TV just lying bluntly, just, just like that. Release the all media survey, when you look at the name Ron Mushet, zero, what? zero, zero. And then they send back to say that they apologize. The lady up there never put in the number. No, Seriously? Um, in terms then, of help, help or like house cleaning. Yeah, my mom was a yeah, my mom was a helper back then and stuff. To be honest, I was just excited. You know, to play for us I did it and I made my move into entrepreneurship at 40. What, you know, last comments would you want to share with you? You have your core values, you do the right things, it'll fall in place for you. Prime Minister Gaston Brown, it is a pleasure to have you joining me on the Trailblazers for a brand new season. A pleasure, my dear. Thank you so much. We were talking off air and I was mentioning that you're actually the second regional leader that I've had on the program. I'm honored. All right. And I'm honored myself. It is indeed a privilege. All right. So as Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, I know many look up to you. You have actually been the leader there since 2014. But at the same time, I understand that you actually grew up, you know, very rough, like you had a rough upbringing. So for those of us who may not know, Share with us about your early beginnings. Well, I'd say I had a very um, exciting upbringing uh, that would have contributed to my practicality and uh, at the same time would have helped me to develop a significant amount of um, resilience uh, to the extent that I'm not easily daunted by challenges. You know, having grown up um, in a single parent home with a mother uh, who was and still is mentally ill, you know, I had to fend for myself at an early age. In fact, my mother became mentally ill when I was nine years old. And, you know, I was practically on my own. I had to literally um, raise myself to some extent. Uh, in fact, I became the um, errand boy within the community to run errands um, to earn, you know, a few cents to buy a half um, bread and butter, drink a little pipe water. So one of the things uh, my humble upbringing taught me to is to be, you know, um, contented and um, you'll find, for example, that, um, you know, as a youngster growing up, um, it didn't take um, much to satisfy me. You know, I wasn't into, you know, any significant amount of um, consumption, even as an adult now, you know, my consumption is extremely limited because I recognize that um, the things that we crave for, especially those that we cannot afford, in many instances, they're really not necessary. I mean, they're just um, things um, that we gravitate to maybe because of um, peer pressure, and maybe all of the um, um, social media and um, general media pressures. Uh, so again, I think that, um, you know, my upbringing, though, you know, characterized um, uh, by poverty, I mean, it was an upbringing that helped to build our um, resilience and to make me um, appreciative of the simpler things in life and not to be um, involved in profligate um, consumption. Yes. And at the same time too, to keep me humble. Indeed, I appreciate you being so authentic and sharing that because 
I myself actually did not even know that. So I mean, especially the issue of mental illness. Luckily, we've come a far way where people are more understanding of it. But I'm sure at that time, as a youngster, the stigma alone must have been quite an issue for you. Well, it is true that, um, you know, my peers tried to stigmatize me to some extent uh, based on the fact that, um, you know, my mother was mentally ill, even as a young politician. There are people who labeled me as um, crazy in inverted commas, and that obviously was because of my mom's illness. So it was utilized against me um, to obviously try and um, subdue me and to, uh, in essence, uh, my political opponents are trying to get um, a leg up on me. But, you know, even in school, it was not a problem. Um, I had a very good social life as a youth. I uh, would have completed, um, you know, my schooling despite um, the difficulties and um, it was involved in social activities and sports. So for some reason, I was not bothered uh, by the matter from my, um, you know, my fellow students. And as an adult, by that time, I was so hardened by the time I entered into politics, uh, my political opponents would use it against me. It just did not work, you know. Uh, so for some reason, um, I can't say that, you know, I saw it as a form of um, bullying that individuals tried to bully me based on the conditions of my, um, uh, the, uh, the, let's say, the, both the um, situation of poverty and the mental condition of my mother. Uh, I know nowadays, um, you know, every little issue is considered to be bullying. I mean, I saw it at the time as a form of um, teasing, grinding, as we call it locally. And for me, it was not an issue. And it was like, you know, water off a, of, a, of a duck's back. Yes. I mean, they even used to tease us about um, the foods that we ate at the time, um, very inexpensive foods, and um, even the dilapidated home that we lived in. So, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up uh, being ridiculed. But again, I think it would have prepared me um, for a political career. Not that I had any such... Um, aspiration to become a politician. In fact, I became um, involved in politics uh, fortuitously. Uh, but in hindsight, you know, that type of ridicule would have helped to thicken my hide. And um, even at this stage um, in my political career, the things that are said about me, um, you know, they do not create any, any worry. I mean, I lead a, uh, quite a, a diverse um, life in terms of my various interests and uh, family certainly is one of my major interests. I mean, I pay a lot of attention to my family, make sure that I keep my family together and empower them as, as much as I can. And generally to serve and empower the people of Antigua and Barbuda, even those in the wider Caribbean who we serve. Indeed, indeed, Prime Minister Brown. And I love the word that you used earlier in terms of the resilience. And we're going to touch a little um, bit later in terms of the political aspect but talk to us also about the role that your grandmother played then with absence of your mother, you know. In right. Yeah. So, you know, I went to live full time with my mother when I was about 13 years of age. Uh, but prior to that, I would have um, lived with my great grandmother who was born in 1894. Uh, she died when I was about 13. So thereafter, I went to live with my mom. Uh, for a short period as well, I mean, I would have lived um, briefly with my mother um, during that period, um, you know, 1 to 13. Uh, now, my great-grandmother, as I said, was born in 1894. She was partially blind and illiterate. So when she went to the bank, for example, to um, withdraw the few dollars that she may have had. Um, so, for example, um, she would have had two children at the time who sent her like a 10 pound or 20 US dollars to help her. That is how she survived from the remittances. Uh, but what would have happened in that case, uh, whenever she went to the bank, she had to use a thumbprint to withdraw the money because she was literally illiterate. Uh, and again, you know, I think I was lucky in that um, she kept me at home for a number of years. In fact, I literally started my formal schooling at um, age eight uh, because at the time, uh, my great-grandmother, uh, who, as I said, was born in 1894. She didn't understand the significance of um, education. Yes. Uh, so she kept me at home and, you know, I was her little pet, literally, and she didn't see the need to send me to school. In fact, the area in which we lived at the time, uh, Grace Farm, Green Bay area, 
she thought that the public school was a little too rough and she didn't want to expose me. So she thought she was doing a good thing, keeping me at home. And then again, she didn't have the capacity to teach me anything. So my mom recognizing, and this is, um, uh, even though my mom was mentally ill, you know, she's not stupid, but recognizing that um, I was actually out of school for an extended um, period. My mom then came and took me to live with her in another ghetto area. And that's when I started my primary school at the Villa Primary School. And I had the indignity of um, we moved from one class to another. Uh, so, for example, um, they started me in junior 1B. And the teacher at the time thought I was brilliant. I mean, obviously, I had good absorptive capacity. So I was able to catch on on the work that I was taught at the time. So but by the second term, she decided to move me into 1A, where the work was a little more difficult. But I didn't have the type of um, the breadth of experience to do the work in, um, in 1A. So that uh, teacher for 1A didn't have to put me back in 1B. Oh. Because she didn't understand, she didn't understand um, the history uh, yeah. behind my education. Uh, the assumption was I was a you know, bright little boy, uh, but I had no depth. Anyway, um, subsequently, I got into the stream and um, right throughout my schooling, you know, I was able to do um, remarkably well, but I didn't have a particularly good start. I had a late start, I had a bad start. And there goes the resilience again, you know. I mean, even though I started late, I was able to recover. And today, you know, I think I'm a productive citizen of the region. Indeed, more than productive <laughs> citizen of the region. You're the prime minister of a nation. I mean, this is fascinating. And I'm just curious then, how is it that for somebody who grew up in such a situation, how, at what point did you make that transition then in terms of your studies, later moving on to even studying at the University of Manchester in the UK? How did that happen for you? Well, I, I think there was some degree of natural ability because, um, you know, I'm not a very studious person. And I felt that, um, you know, I was able to uh, catch up um, based on, I guess, natural ability. And um, from that standpoint, you know, I, after having, having such a bad start, I became uh, just as normal as any other student, having closed the gap, and was able to progress to the extent that I would have completed a master's degree successfully. Uh, so again, you know, maybe it's a form of um, built-in resilience uh, because I find myself, um, generally speaking, you know, from the time I knew myself, not to be intimidated by anyone, notwithstanding the society, the standing within the society. In fact, I recall um, one of my uncles said to me some years ago that, um, you know, when I was a youngster, young teenager, he visited me at home. You know, he, um, you know, was a well-known PhD and so on, well celebrated. Uh, but he said, um, whereas everybody was role playing to him, you know, I just said to him, um, welcome, um, you know, Uncle Winston. And um, in a matter of a few minutes, I was out on the road um, playing my sports. Oh, know, wow. And, um, worshiping, worshiping, him, like, worshiping him as the others. So, yes. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not disrespectful to people, but I mean, the, the type of um, situation which you role play and, and, and play this inferior role. It is not within my psyche. And again, I think I've accepted challenges, maybe because I've had so many. Yeah. I mean, I've had some near-death experiences as well. What? And like I'm what? Told, yeah, I'm told, um, for example, um, when I was pretty young, as a toddler, apparently I was very ill. And I believe, too, that is one of the reasons why I started school late. I mean, I started walking at about age four. Apparently, I was very ill. And my mom said to me, she had even given up at me, and, uh, on me at one point. And then she said, um, after... A period of time um, being hospitalized. I mean, she visited me on one occasion and saw, you know, quite a bouncing um, baby boy and could boy. not believe it was her child. Wow. Uh, so that was one occasion. In fact, what had happened too, you know, my mom, you know, found herself in an unfortunate situation which she could not have taken care of me at the time. And I ended up having a malnutrition. So even on my official health card, you know, they would have documented the fact that I was on the develop. Um, at the time, I think um, that particular card was about two years old and um, I was on the develop and I was diagnosed with um, malnutrition. So I think it um, stunted my growth to some extent. And, you know, by the time I was four years old, I was still on the develop. But for some reason, again, grew out of it and wow. um, became quite a healthy young man. And, you know, as I say, hit wood. I mean, I'm still in relatively good health up to this day. So I give thanks.
Yes. Again, the resilience. And I can't tell you where that resilience came from. I mean, it is something that happened. I mean, from the time I was a youth. I had a situation too in which on one occasion, um, in fact, my dear great grandmother as well was born in 1894. She was an alcoholic. So she used to drink um, this very harsh white rum. Uh, but she used to give me a little for a little of the rum for the worm, just a little cockful. Yes. So one occasion she was stone drunk and I was in the house with her and I went and drank off a whole pint of rum. Wow. They hospitalized me and pumped me out and so on. And um, again, so I, you know, I was able to um, survive that as a youth. I may have been about six years old at the time. Yes. Then on another occasion, I almost uh, suffered a, uh, well, a near um, execution. Uh, electrocution, I should say, rather. Electrocution. Let me get mm-hmm. it right. Uh, what happened? Um, I uh, held on to an electric wire, not knowing it was an electric wire. Uh, it didn't appear to be one. Um, was one of those uninsulated um, electric wires. Um, it wasn't the contemporary type at the time, which I was okay. accustomed to. It was apparently um, done several decades before. A very thin line, but it was an electric wire that um, mm-hmm. uh, was used to power a particular school building where we normally play in the courtyard. I was the first there. Saw this, um, uh, this wire, which I didn't um, recognize to be an electric wire, held it. And, oh, my um, gosh. You know, I mean, I had a situation which it actually burnt the back, burnt on the back of my hand, and um, I was there praying, couldn't let go of the wire. And there's a raster man at the time, a gentleman by the name of Kenya, who heard me praying, asking the Lord to save my life, and he came over and cut the wire, saved my life. Wow! So I've been through lots of squalls, uh, but those squalls have made me a better person and a stronger person. And as I said, I mean, I'm just not daunted by anything. Indeed. I mean, even the period during the period of COVID. Um, Whereas we are respectful of um, COVID, I know COVID is still around, but we're trying to last three years. Um, you know, whereas most people were frightened by it, you know, we respected it. But as I said to my colleagues, we had to learn to live and work with COVID. So it's not a coincidence that Antigua and Barbuda was the first country to reopen its um, borders in uh, on the first of June of 2020. It's because you know we just weren't daunted by it. Uh, mm-hmm. We have literally achieved now you know full normalcy. I mean, we re- remove all the restrictions. Uh, next week, or maybe this week, we are likely to remove the requirement for wearing masks uh, again because we think that you know r- risk are there to be managed, not to avoid. And um, whereas we will continue to respect COVID as a very menacing disease, uh, we will not be daunted by it. Uh, and, and again, I have to tell you, when you look at the level of the or the impact of COVID on the domestic. Um, um, society. I mean, we lost 20% of our GDP in 2020. And if we had not taken that um, bold step uh, as early as June 1st to move towards reopening the country's economy, we would have been serious problems. We would have had to probably let go thousands of um, public servants because we're among the hardest hit. And the reason for that is because, you know, the economy is so tourism independent. Yeah. That we became, you know, among the hardest hit in the world. Mm-hmm. And to lose 20% of the GDP in one year, you can understand the impact. But yet still, we're able to keep things together. We didn't let go a single public servant. We met our obligations. And again, that came through some level of creativity, of course, but resilience uh, goes right back to resilience. So I'll say this, that my own experience has been a life of resilience. And I'm now using it too at the national level to help our country to um, deal with the challenges that arise from time to time. Indeed, and I definitely appreciate that. That is definitely the theme for this interview, resilience. Resilience. And as we continue along that trajectory, in terms of your experience then being in London and then returning working in business, tell us about that because first and foremost, you were a banker, if I should get that correctly, right? Correct. Yes, so tell us about your, your banking experience, your business side. Right, so I left um, A levels and applied to several banks, including the Swiss American Banking Group. And I got employed by the Swiss American Banking Group. Um, that's a banking group that comprised of a domestic bank, an offshore bank, and a trust company. And after about um, four or five years, yeah, I found myself, um, you know, um, being elevated. Um, I became a senior supervisor within the bank to the extent the director of the bank decided to give me a scholarship first to do a banking degree and then subsequently a master's degree. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. You know, and then after I completed my degree, they promoted me into management. Mm -hmm. So from about um, age um, probably 26, somewhere around there, I became a senior manager within the bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I'll go back by stating here after I left A levels. I mean, my plans initially, you know, was to do something um, in the field of science, um, probably um, biochemistry or maybe a chemist or something, because as my strong subjects um, were um, chemistry and biology. Mm -hmm. But obviously, at that time, we didn't have any scholarship programs. Um, only one scholarship pro scholarship at the time, a national scholarship. So finding the funds to go to university, that was an impossibility. So I had to work. Yeah. And just like anyone else, I applied um, to the, um, in fact, I applied to airlines as well. And um, I know I was offered a job by Liat, by American Airline, as well as a bank. So I chose a bank job, which I felt was the best one, was the best yeah. choice. Uh, eventually, as I said, I found my way into senior management and um, would have had a good stint there. Um, in fact, the only person who at the time was senior to me when I left the bank was a general manager. Uh, so, you know, I was, um, you know, I had a good stint, uh, you know, as a banker That's and would have used the opportunity to help a number of people to establish your business and so on. So it was easily one of the most um, exciting um, things that I've done, you know, serving as a banker. But interestingly, too, I was always very entrepreneurial. So yeah. I also, um, while I was working at the bank, um, uh, diversified into business and would have done a number of businesses um, in real estate. Um, at one point, two hours, um, part owner of a car company as well. Yeah. Uh, so from about age um, 20, 21, I actually started, um, you know, my business career concurrently while working at the bank. Awesome. Then, you know, back in 1998, uh, you know, I had certain members of the Labour Party decided to pursue me about a political career. Initially, I turned it down because at that time I was making about 16,000 EC dollars a month mm -hmm. and I didn't see the need to get involved in politics. Uh, 16,000 EC is close to 6,000 years a month and this is back wow. in 1998. Yeah. And maybe it was somewhat of a selfish decision too and, um, you know, having a good career path. I mean, I just didn't see the need. Anyway, they came back and insisted that I should, you know, take a look at it and make a try. And I did um, participate in a primary, won the primary, and then I um, was elected in 1999 for the first time. So I served them um, in the Lester Bread administration for, uh, for, for, for one term um, between 1999 and 2004. Served as the Minister of Planning and then subsequently the Minister of Planning and Trade until 2004 when we lost the elections. That is very interesting because I remember you were saying that, well, you just said it, that when they approached you initially, you were not interested and politi politics was never something that you actually had in your plan. So well, I tell you this much. Uh, prior to 1999 elections, I mean, I was not a registered voter, never voted, never went to a political meeting, never had any discussion with any politician, which was minding my own business. Wow, that is in. So, was it a difficult switch for you then, or you found it to be smooth? Well, there were challenges, but again, I was never daunted. And yeah. some of the things that I had to endure, maybe it would have caused, um, you know, others to probably step back and 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 change the course of action. But as I said, there's this. Um, I don't know if it's a quiet determination about me. You know, if I decide I'm going to do something, I'm going to get it done. And um, I, I don't worry about um, challenges. There will always be challenges. I mean, what is life without challenges? So, I mean, yes, uh, there are a number of issues. In fact, myself and the den leader didn't get on very well because he felt I was a little too um, outspoken. Wow. But we're always very respectful of each other. And that is the former Prime Minister Bird. Correct. Mr. Correct. Bird. Who's Correct. niece you're... Well, that's for another discussion further on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I'm also very inclusive. Yes. And um, I do not carry malice, hatred. Yes. Uh, I'm very strident in my politics, but, um, you know, inclusive in terms of embracing all. And you are right that at one point to um, Celeste and I, you know, competed for the leadership. I challenged him and, as you know, defeated him in 2013 for the leadership of the anti Party, or 2012, rather. It was November 2012, and I defeated him. But I had run um, prior, prior to 2012. I had actually challenged him um, 
seven years before, and he defeated wow. me. But wow. coming back to the issue of resilience, by the way, he knew I was going to come back. Uh, so you would have found that um, during that period, our relationship was not the best because he knew I was coming back. He didn't know when. Oh. So he was always trying to keep me at bay, knowing, hey, you know, I defeated, he defeated me in um, 2005. But another challenge is going to come at some point. Mm-hmm. It came in um, 20, 2012 when um. I defeated him and took over the leadership of the party. And then, you know, one, I, one of my challenges going into the 2014 elections, I had to heal the party. I had to bring, um, you know, everybody back together. So interestingly, after I defeated Celeste, and, and for me, it was not a personal vendetta. I just felt that, um, you know, he had age and the party needed fresh legs and, um, you know, to take over the governance of the country. We needed to present um, fresh leadership. And I took the position at the time that, you know, to spend the rest of my life in um opposition or to spend five more years or 10 more years in opposition, definitely not. And I felt that I had a contribution to make towards the socioeconomic and political development of the country. So I decided to challenge him and was successful. Uh, so what I did um, after I defeated him, I placed him to sit ahead of me in the parliament of Antigua and Barbuda, uh, made him our emeritus leader. And it was a mark of respect to him to let him know, yes, I've defeated you, but I'm very respectful of the contribution that you've made towards the development of our country. We subsequently uh, made him international hero. Uh, so that, you know, helped to subdue him to some extent because he was not a happy camper, um, you know, after I defeated him and he had his own t- whole um, team of supporters, um, some of whom are ministers um, today in my administration who were supporting him and, you know, who were literally trying to split the party. But again, I was successful in bringing the entire team together. So by the time 2014 came for the general elections, we were ready, united and ready. And we have to defeat the incumbent UPPM party. Now you are right that in 2013 I uh, marry his uh, um, his niece, his niece. Uh, who incidentally is also the minister of um, housing and lands, and yes. um, you know Lady M- uh, Maria Brown, a most beautiful young lady. So yes, you know is. again I, I have to say here that you know from the time I knew myself, I characterized myself as a blessed person. To the extent for many years, even up to now, um, my introductory political song is Mr. Vegas, I am blessed. Ah, oh, yes, I love the blessing. Oh, very nice. I, I do believe it. I believe that I am blessed um, because, you know, my life could have gone in any direction. Yes. But again, I would have exercised a significant amount of discipline, um, resilience and love of people. I think that is what has helped as well. I mean, in as much as... Um, you know, I have the capacity to be very strident um, in my opposition to others. Uh, generally speaking, it's not about um, any hatred, dislike, uh, envy. Uh, it's just about a difference of opinion. And, you know, I could be strident about it. But notwithstanding that after that issue is resolved, it is not resolved, we could be best of friends. Definitely. And I really appreciate that. I mean, again, the word resilient comes up because to have been in opposition for 10 years, and then come back and become, you know, the leader, not only of the party, but winning the general election back in 2014. And since then serving as prime minister, that must be like mind blowing for you. Or it was something that you just expected. Well, no, I would say mind blowing. I mean, you know, I, I have very simple expectations. And um, but however, my work ethic is such that, you know, almost invariably, you know, I will achieve my, my objectives and they're not mind boggling in the sense that I, I would have had at the back of my mind that whatever I pursue is achievable. Yes. I mean, I do not set unrealistic goals. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, when I achieve them, I can't be surprised by them because I would have seen them to be achievable in the first instance. Awesome. Tune in next week to part two of the resilient story of Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda the Honorable Gaston Brown. Hey everyone, I'm Tamar McHale, a television and radio presenter, producer, communication specialist, and of course, producer and host of the Trailblazer series. I'm inviting you, yes, you, to join our family. All you have to do is just click that subscribe button right below. Make sure you hit the notification bell so you're alerted as to when we have new episodes. And of course, join our family for weekly inspiring and uplifting episodes that will give you the tools, the keys, and the strategies that you need so that you can blaze your trail. 